Okay, good afternoon, everyone. It is about one o'clock, and so we will go ahead and get started with our March Ranching 101 session as everyone is jumping on. A few reminders that I want to go ahead and uh, start before um, we dive into our session today. Um, we do have some upcoming Ranching 101 sessions that will be hosted online, just like the Ranching 101 is today. Our April session will be hosted a Tuesday, April 20th, and that will be on basic ranch record keeping practices by Cattle Max. Uh, Jimmy Curtis is an operations manager, and we'll talk about the basic records that need to be kept for best optimization in a ranching uh, situation. Tuesday, May 18th, uh, we'll have Joe Patronella from Capital Farm Credit talk about your land, your legacy, and the law, common law and liability issues that may face uh, farmers, ranchers, and landowners across the state. And then Tuesday, June 15th, we'll have uh, folks from the Livestock Nutrition Center talk about nutrition, what a cow really needs. And so those are our upcoming Ranching 101 sessions if you want to add them to your calendar. And then as you may have seen, hopefully you know that the Cattle Raisers Convention and Expo has been postponed to July 23rd through 25th in Fort Worth, Texas. So we hope you'll join us. Registration for that should be open in the coming weeks. Um, as the session progresses today, if you have any questions, uh, at the bottom of your screen, you can see uh, a button that says Q&A and also chat. If you have questions as we move through the presentation, please feel free um, to put those questions down below and hopefully we will get to them. If not, we'll make sure to get you an answer after the session concludes. So with that, I would like to turn it over to our presenter today, Dr. Vanessa Olson. We'll be talking about grass and forage implementation and identification in different areas across the state. So um, thank you so much to Dr. Olson for spending time with us today. And with that, I'll turn it over to you. All right, thank you. So like she said, my name is Vanessa Coyer Olson. I'm the Forage Extension Specialist with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension. And I am based out of Overton, so I am in East Texas. Um, so if you're familiar with Tyler, Kilgore, Longview area, uh, Overton is basically between Tyler and Longview. So I'm in I'm basically East Texas, um, almost closer to Louisiana than just about anything else, about two hours east of Dallas. So like she said, I'm gonna talk about grass and forage identification and implementation. Um, so we're basically going to cover forage species um, that are adapted to or adapted within or to various parts of the state of Texas. Um, and so we'll talk about how those can be utilized in our forage systems, uh, maybe some positive or negative attributes of these various forage species, where they fit as far as location within our state. So hopefully if you are trying to make decisions about forage species that are beneficial or uh, will not work within your forage system, hopefully you will glean some of that from today's presentation. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions, um, and so we'll go ahead and get started. So when we, obviously, the basis of our livestock production systems are going to be our forages. So a lot of people refer to themselves as um, livestock producers or cattlemen, but we are really primarily and first most, we are forage producers, and then we use our livestock to harvest those forages, or we're harvesting forages to support our livestock in a, in a kind of a harvested forage, whether it's hay or silage, what have you. Um, so our primary base is, uh, is our forages. So our forage can selection can become a very critical component of our beef cattle or livestock production systems. And not just beef cattle, um, but also for horses or other livestock that we might have on our property as well, or part of our, part of our livestock production system. So we need to think about what, what is the goal of a forage system, and you personally need to think about what is the goal of your forage system. Um, it may be beef cattle production, it may be a cow-calf production, you may have stalkers. Um, it may be a combination of things. It may be livestock as well as trying to support or promote wildlife. You may want to lease part of your property for hunting purposes, or you may just want to support wildlife in general. Um, 
just because you're interested in the beautification of your property and seeing wildlife on your property, such as white-tailed deer or, or other small birds and mammals. Um, so you personally need to think about what your overall goals for your farm and ranch are, um, and then what forages will support that forage system or that system that you've decided to, to implement into your, onto your location or into your production system. So keep that in mind. Um, your goals are likely to vary from someone else who has joined us today um, and may even change your shift over the years um, as your interests, your hobbies, or your, your resources shift. Um, so you have to keep that in mind. What are your goals? Um, of course, if we are supporting livestock, our primary goal is to support their nutrition, is to make sure we are meeting their nutritional needs whether it's through grazing as well as um, in coordination with any harvested forages as well, whether we are purchasing those forages or maybe we're growing those harvested forages on our property as well. So um, a lot of things to think about. We wanna make sure that we are matching our production system to our forage system. Um, and so we may or may not need to make changes in our forage system, but we do need to keep in mind that our forage system or the forages that we utilize on our property are going to be based on our location within the state. Obviously, as we look at the state of Texas, I'm primarily focused on our annual precipitation or our average annual precipitation. Obviously, for, for those of us in East Texas, we tend to have higher average annual precipitation as opposed to those as we move west across the state. Um, so hopefully you're already familiar with the average annual precipitation within your location. Obviously that can shift um, from time to time based on your location in the state, based on natural events such as hurricanes um, or major snowfall, winter weather events um, like we had back in the middle of February. Um, so, excuse me, it's very important to understand whether you are in a very droughty or very dry location of the state, very arid environment versus a, a location that has, has higher average annual rainfall. Um, many of our forage species, uh, some of our forage species may be more drought tolerant than others. A lot of our forage species, of course, their production, the amount of forage they produce is going to be dependent on rainfall. Um, so we will talk about talk about that as we talk about different species or varieties and whether or not they're drought tolerant or require high average annual rainfall to be productive and persistent uh, within that environment. Another aspect that will influence our forage systems is our soil type. Um, so this is a, a, a map of our vegetational areas of Texas. This does take into account some soil variation um, if you wanted to see a more detailed souls map, there is actually one behind my head. Um, you may be able to see it. You can see it has much larger number of different colors as opposed to this vegetational areas. Um, but this is fairly simplified showing 10 different vegetational areas in our state. And so our forages can be very specific in regards to where they will persist and grow as far as soil type, as well as rainfall. Um, and we'll talk about that as we talk about some of our different forage species. So location, location, location really means a lot, is key in regards to matching an adapted forage species to your location. Um, so very important to understand rainfall and as well as your soil type. So our forage system should be customized to your operation, to your goals as a rancher, um, goals for your general, your life, for the, the production system on your ranch, as well as your soil type, is that do you have a lot of sand in your soil or a lot of clay? Is it a well-drained or poorly drained location? And then of course your resources, um, as far as what equipment do you have to establish that forage? How are you going to maintain a stand? Um, if it's a perennial, obviously we want it to persist for more than one season. Are you going to be able to, or do you want to invest a lot in fertilizer as well as herbicides or pesticides to control any pest that could be problematic for that given species? So one way to learn more about your soil type, if you're not already familiar with, we won't go into a lot of detail, um, the NR USDA NRCS has a free resource, a website. It is the Web Soil Survey, the best way to locate this website 
um, is to just Google or use a search engine on your internet browser and just type in Web Soul Survey. Um, that will be the first thing that pops up. You click the green button um, and it starts you into their database. You can use um, GPS coordinates. So if your property does not have a physical address, um, GPS coordinates would be the best way to locate that property. And then you can highlight, you can select various pastures or an entire landscape or an entire area, and it will tell you what the different soil types are in that, in, on that property or within that location. Um, keep in mind, no matter where you are in the state, you probably have soil variation across your property. Um, so you may have a well-drained sandy hill, but then you may also have a bottom that is prone to flooding. Um, so this is an excellent resource, an excellent tool to determine the soil types, the different types of soil that are on your property, and then to match the best forage species or the best adapted forage species to that location. Um, establishment of any forage species is going to likely be expensive, costly, and take time. And obviously we want to, we want to have success if we're going to introduce or establish or plant a new forage species or forage species or multiple forage species onto our property. We want to have success. So one of the first steps is matching an adapted species or variety to your location. Um, so this is a great place to start if you're not familiar with your property. This is also a great tool if you are looking to buy property and you want to know more about it and maybe whomever you're buying it from doesn't have all of the information or can't answer all of your questions. This is something that you can do that has no cost to you. Um, it's not impeding on anybody's privacy. Um, and you can look at that, that property in advance and see what the different soil types are, um, and then determine what species you might want to introduce to fit your forage system or your production system goals. So most of our cow-calf systems are gonna be based on perennial forages. And those are forages that are going to be, once they are established, as long as we support their growth with fertilization and as, as long as they are adapted to that location, they will persist for multiple years. Um, a majority of the forages that we utilize in Texas for livestock are going to be introduced forage species. Um, so this is Bermuda grass. This is in actually a picture in central Texas. This is coastal Bermuda grass. Um, believe it or not, Bermuda grass is not native to the state of Texas. We will talk about native species, but first of all, we are going to talk about introduced species. So Bermuda grass is, is native to Africa and South Africa. It is not native to the United States and it's not native to Texas. <clears throat> so if anybody ever says something like native Bermuda grass, it's, it's more likely it's common Bermuda grass, but it's not native to their location if, if they're in Texas. So Bermuda grass is, is a warm season perennial that is widely used throughout the southeast of the United States, um, along with Bahia grass, which is another warm season perennial forage or grass species that's widely used throughout the southeast. So our warm season perennial grasses, um, and we'll talk about our introduced species, are well adapted to our higher summer temperatures, they tend to be adapted to almost more tropical environment where we have high temperatures, may have high rainfall. Um, our warm season perennial grasses will initiate new growth in March or April. That of course will depend on where you're located in our state, um, where your latitude is um, it, within the state of Texas. So our more Northern um, locations, our Bermuda grass may not break dormancy as early as more southern environments uh, within our state. So where I'm located in East Texas, our Bermuda grass tends to break dormancy around March or April. It may not necessarily start actively growing until April or May. Um, that really depends on our weather. There have been years where Bermuda grass has broken dormancy in February, um, but did not actively start growing until April or even May. Now last year, our Bermuda grass um, did not start actively growing until June. Uh, we had a very cool spring, very cool, um, cooler winter. And so that delayed the, the onset of our Bermuda grass or our warm season perennial grasses and their growth. So their growth slows when our night temperatures drop below 50 degrees Fahrenheit, and then they will go dormant. They'll turn brown um, and they'll actually go dormant for that winter season. 
like I said, our warm season perennial grasses are the pretty much the foundation of most of our summer pastures throughout the southeast of the United States, from Texas all the way over to Florida, Georgia, um, even into North and South Carolina. So as far as timing for utilization, this is just a, a graph kind of showing that timeline of, of growth initiated in April, uh, March, April. We do tend to see a decrease or a decline in growth and production of those warm season perennial grasses when our temperatures are exceeding um, are high in the 90s or higher during, during the day, when our night temperatures are in the 80s or above, oftentimes our warm season perennials will actually, their growth will actually slow. Um, they're just not going to be nearly as productive during that hot, dry kind of dog days of the summer. Um, can see an increase in their growth and production in the fall, um, right before going dormant. For us, our average frost date is about November 15th. Your frost date may be earlier or later, depending on your location in the state. Um, so that can influence your season of production um, based on your location. So one of our warm season perennials, Bermuda grass is obviously very popular um, throughout the Southeast of the United States. Um, it is well adapted to, our, to a variety of soil types. Um, we do primarily see most of our Bermuda grass in East Texas, from the central part of the state, even into East Texas. There are some producers in the panhandle of Texas that do have Bermuda grass. A lot of that is going to be under irrigation. Bermuda grass is drought tolerant. However, um, it does do better in areas where there's higher average annual rainfall. So that production and persistence will still be dependent on moisture availability. Um, it does have excellent drought tolerance. And during the drought of 2011, um, a lot of our Bermuda grass went, may have gone dormant where it turned brown, so it went dormant early. However, it still persisted beyond the drought as long as it had been fertilized appropriately in previous seasons. So that fertility or soil fertility in our management practices can influence the persistence of these perennial forages. So as you're selecting a forage species, it is important to understand what is needed for persistence um, as far as fertility, grazing management, those things can influence how long our perennial forages will actually stay in those environments. Bermuda grass produces both stolons and rhizomes, and those are above ground and below ground shoots, um, kind of stems. Um, if you've ever seen Bermuda grass, you'll see tiller, um, tillering or runners that move across the top of the soil surface to produce additional plants. We have the same thing under the soil surface as well. So Bermuda grass, produces or creates a very dense sod. It covers the soil surface very completely. That is excellent for preventing soil erosion, um, which is one aspect of maintaining soil health is to produce or to reduce, excuse me, soil erosion. So to maintain active vegetative growth. Um, so Bermuda grass does that well, as long as, is, as it is managed appropriately for that forage species. There are different methods of establishment. We have a lot of different varieties of Bermuda grass. There are seeded varieties that can be established by seed. Um, and then there are hybrid varieties or vegetative types that even though they produce a seed head, they don't produce enough viable seed. So they have to be established by vegetative material. Um, that is often referred to as sprigs, where you have part of the root structure as well as some leaf material, some top growth. Um, some varieties of hybrid Bermuda grass can be established from tops where you basically just have clipped some leaves primarily that you would be planting into a prepared seed bin. Of our Bermuda grass varieties, um, currently Tifton 85 is the highest in nutritive value compared to many of our other warm season perennial grasses, but especially compared to other Bermuda grass varieties, and it is also the most productive if it has the nutrients that are needed for that production and persistence. Um, <clears throat> Tifton 85 is a variety that came out of um, Glenn Burton's um, breeding program, Bermuda grass breeding program out of the University of Georgia. It was released in 1993. Um, so that tells you how old uh, Tifton 85 is. There are, most people think Bermuda grass is king in regards to uh, forages for livestock in the Southeast, but there are some disadvantages. 
So just because your neighbor has Bermuda grass does not necessarily mean that that will work best for your system. So you have to think about all aspects, what's adapted to your location, and then what works for you. Um, so just because somebody else grows it doesn't mean that you should or that you need to or that it will work within your location. So some disadvantages are some people find that having to plant vegetative material is more challenging. Um, it does tend to require specialized equipment. In the right hand corner there, that is a Bermuda King. That is an actual sprig planter. Um, this was when I was doing my graduate work at the University of Georgia in Tipton, Georgia, and we were actually sprigging some Tipton 85 Bermuda grass. So that is what that piece of equipment looks like. Um, there are many producers throughout Central and East Texas that um, produce or grow and harvest sprigs or dig sprigs for the purpose of planting. You often can hire someone to actually plant the sprigs for you. Um, that may be the cost of that vary. Um, the cost of sprigs is typically somewhere from three to four dollars per bushel. Um, and you're looking at planting about 30 to 40 bushels per acre in regards to sprigs, if you're planting sprigs. Um, so Bermuda grass to be persistent and productive is going to require some level of fertilizer input. Um, some varieties are more demand, especially our hybrid varieties that are established vegetatively, tend to have, tend to require more inputs for them to persist and to be productive. Of course, they tend to be more productive um, and they tend to often are higher in nutritive value, especially Tipton 85. So therefore they do require more inputs. Um, there can be some variety differences in regards to fertilizer input, drought tolerance, um, et cetera. So if you are interested in Bermuda grass and want more specific variety information, I'll be happy to answer any of those questions. I actually have a publication on different Bermuda grass varieties. I'm happy to direct you to that as well. Um, so there are a lot of pros and cons. Um, the cost of establishment of Bermuda grass can potentially be a con for, for many folks. Um, the last time I priced sprigging versus seeded, planting a seed, um, a seeded variety, um, establishing seeded Bermuda grass was actually much more expensive compared to sprigging. And that is not necessarily always the case. Um, so always do your research, ask questions, um, get the cost of things such as seed versus sprigs um, more locally to where you are located. But the last time I priced it kind of locally for East Texas, it was actually more expensive to seed the plant a seeded variety compared to sprigs. Now you also have to think about the cost of maintaining that hybrid variety versus something such as common Bermuda grass that will persist with a little less inputs compared to Tipton 85. So here's just some comparison. Um, our varieties can look fairly different. On the left, you have common Bermuda grass, and then on the right, Tipton 85. Um, Tipton 85 is, is quite different from common or even coastal Bermuda grass. It has a, as you can see, it has a bigger leaf, a broader leaf. It also has more stem. You see less leaf compared to stem when you compare it to something like common Bermuda grass. Um, this can unfortunately lead people to think that Tipton 85 is of lower quality because there's more stem. And a majority of our nutritive value in our forages is found in the leaf material. However, Tipton 85 is an exception to that rule. Um, so when you're talking about nutritive value of our forages, the best way to know the true value would be a forage analysis, um, especially if you're looking at hay quality as far as marketing hay or buying hay. A forage analysis is really the only way to know the true value of that forage as opposed to just basing it off of, of appearance. So some other differences between some varieties. Um, this is um, data from Glenn Burton um, at the University of Georgia comparing some different hybrid varieties. So all of these Bermuda grass varieties would have to be established from sprigs um, or possibly tops. Um, You'll notice the blue bars are for yield and the red bars are for, for digestibility or energy value of that forage. And then of course, as you look across those bars, you see coastal and then you see Tipton 85 there in the center. Um, coastal Bermuda grass, if you will notice, both of those bars are capped out at 100%. So coastal Bermuda grass was released in 1943, so 50 years before Tipton 85. 
Um, so coastal is basically the kind of the measuring stick in regards to comparing other hybrid varieties of Bermuda grass too. Um, so that is why it is set at 100%. So with this chart, we can only compare each individual variety back to coastal. So if we compare Tipton 85 to coastal, it is higher yielding and also has higher energy value or higher nutritive value compared to coastal Bermuda grass. And that is if everything is equal in regards to harvesting time, fertilizer inputs, et cetera, rainfall, um, what have you. So there can be some variety differences, but of course it's always best to make sure they are adapted to your location. Um, Bermuda grass, like I said, is adapted to a variety of soil types. Um, Tipton 85 and coastal Bermuda grass prefer well-drained soils. Um, so if you have a poorly drained location that's prone to flooding, um, you may be able to establish one of those two varieties. Um, however, they may or they're not likely to persist. Um, I like to refer to them as that they do not like to have their feet wet. Now there is a variety of Bermuda grass that is called Jigs Bermuda grass. It is a hybrid variety that was, it was actually located in um, a producer's field. Um, and it has been, it is a um, basically a, an actual named variety. Um, it has the correct scientific paper um, or science or paper or information to support it as a variety, as, a tr as an actual variety. Um, Jigs Bermuda grass prefers poorly drained locations, bottom lands. Um, if we go, if we move into Beaumont, Texas, where a lot of that property is below sea level, um, Tipton 85 and coastal Bermuda grass just do not do well. They will not persist. But Jigs Bermuda grass does very well in those areas that have poorly drained soils or soils that hold a lot of moisture. Bahia grass is another warm season perennial that's very common throughout the southeast. Um, it is well adapted to sandy soils. It does require higher rainfall areas, so 30 to 35 inches. Um, so central and east Texas is where our primary location for much of our Bahia grass production is in, in Texas. A lot of people view Bahia grass as a weed, but it is actually a very valuable forage. As far as nutritive value, Bahia grass is similar to coastal Bermuda grass, so it's not as high of nutritive value as Tipton 85, but it is comparable to coastal Bermuda grass. It does tolerate close continuous grazing, very similar to Bermuda grass. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't create as dense of a sod as Bermuda grass does. Now, if you have a good stand of Bahia grass, you are still going to reduce soil erosion. Um, so you still have that benefit with Bahia grass as well. Um, Bahia grass will persist much more so than Bermuda grass on lower fertilizer inputs. That's often why we see Bahia grass encroaching into Bermuda grass stands as we have <clears throat> kind of reduced our fertilization or overgrazed our Bermuda grass stands. Bahia grass in those locations can often move in if there is seed in the soil or seed movement into that property. Some disadvantages of Bahia grass, it is not drought tolerant. So it will not grow in our more arid environment, <clears throat> probably not even with irrigation. It would require a lot of irrigation, a lot of water inputs to maintain that stand. So not likely to be economically uh, worth it um, in those situations. Um, it does not respond as well to fertilizer as Bermuda grass does. Bermuda grass, you can continue to apply as much nitrogen as you want and your yield will continue to improve or increase as long as rainfall is not limited. However, Bahia grass kind of basically hits a ceiling. It only responds to so much. Um, so we'll, we'll need to understand that as far as fertilization practices for different forage species. Now there are some other introduced warm season perennial systems um, that work in other parts of our state or that are more commonly used in other parts of our state. Um, and one of those is um, one of one of those systems is old world blue stems. Um, now there are different species of old world blue stems. Um, they are all warm season perennials. Some of the ones you may have heard of are WWB doll. There's a Caucasian. Um, there's a, I think a yellow blue stem, WW Ironmaster, WW Spar. And there are a variety of different introduced old world blue stems. And KR or King Ranch blue stem is actually an old world blue stem. Now it is in the state of Texas is deemed to be um, invasive. And I get a lot of questions about controlling KR blue stem. 
Um, it was introduced into our state to help with soil erosion. And unfortunately, it is very, it has spread very quickly and it's very invasive. I think it was originally used along roadsides and then wind and other equipment, et cetera, has moved that seed into pasture and cropland. Um, and it has no, has very little value as a forage. So it is actually sought out as, as controlling. And we'll talk about that as ways to control KR bluestem as opposed to growing it. And we'll talk about that here in a second. But our old world blue stems, um, we tend to see those utilized quite a bit in the panhandle of our state, as well as um, even in some of the central parts of our state. Our old world blue stems are best adapted to our loam or clay loam soils. They do not do very well in our very sandy soils in the eastern part of our state. So where I'm located in the Piney Woods, we have a lot of sandy soils. Um, so we have no old world blue stem utilization in this part of the state because they're just not adapted to our very sandy soils. So a lot of people get those old world blue stems confused with our native blue stems such as little blue stem or big blue stem. So they are very different. They are totally different species. Um, old world blue stems are established by seed. They can be utilized by grazing as you can see here. This happens to be Clayburg blue stem. Um, they can also be harvested for hay if there is interest in that as well. Um, they are warm season perennials. They do have more production in the middle of the summer, kind of in the heat and drier conditions. They're more drought tolerant compared to some of our other introduced Bermuda grass or Bahia grass. So they do tend to have more production where you saw most of our warm season perennials, their production dips down in that June, July, August time period. Um, our old world blue stems will have actually have higher, often have higher production at that time. So those may be an option depending on your, your location. Um, they do begin their growth in late April, as many of our other warm season perennials do as well. Um, some other warm season perennials that are introduced, one I wanted to mention is Klein grass. Um, Klein grass is commonly utilized in the central part of our state, is well adapted to our heavier soils, our black land clays or heavy clay soils that oftentimes Bermuda grass really struggles to do very, to persist very well. Um, or that has been, that has been the, a lot of the situations that I have seen um, for especially some of our really heavy soils. Klein grass is an option primarily for cattle. Klein grass is not recommended for sheep, for goats, or for horses. Um, it actually can be toxic to those livestock species. So that is something else to be aware of if you are multi-species grazing or you have multiple livestock species on your property. Make sure those forage species are not toxic or detrimental to different livestock species. But um, Klein grass can be effectively utilized for cattle, for hay production, if you are selling Klein grass hay, just make sure you are marketing that primarily to cattle producers, um, since it can be toxic to horses as well as sheep and goats. Um, so that will be very important. But Klein grass is also an introduced, um, it was introduced into the United States. I think it came out of Asia. <clears throat> um, our old world blue stems definitely came out of Asia. Um, Klein grass, I'm sorry, came out of Africa. Um, often get some of those confused. So that may be another warm season, introduced warm season perennial grass that we can utilize in our beef cattle production systems. So I mentioned KR blue stem or King Ranch blue stem. I did want to talk about eradication that came as a question that was, um, was wanted answered prior to the presentation. Like I said, it is very invasive. Here are some, some pictures of KR blue stem. Um, <clears throat> so one option is Pastora. There has been some work. Um, Pastora is a product that's labeled for Bermuda grass pastures and hay meadows. The active ingredients are metsulfuron methyl and nicosulfuron. Pastora will only temporarily suppress KR blue stem. Um, that may be beneficial, but it's temporary. So it's not a long-term fix, unfortunately. What we have found to be effective as, as far as the rate and timing with Pastora is a half ounce um, applied kind of at the beginning of the season, potentially in the spring, followed by a second half ounce, half ounce application six weeks later. So that would only be temporary suppression. 
So you would likely see some regrowth later that season um, following those applications. So for true eradication, really our only option is glyphosate, which is the active ingredient found in products such as Roundup or Glystar. Um, there are other trade or product names that have the active ingredient glyphosate. Um, you can broadcast an application of 3.3 quarts per acre um, in the spring after green up and then a second application in the fall. You could also do a spot treatment where you're spraying individual plants. Maybe if you have a corner of a pasture or hay meadow where KR blue stem is starting to move in, um, you can do a spot treatment with a one and a half percentage of glyphosate type rate for an individual plant treatment method. Um, but Texas A&M AgriLife Extension, many of our range um, specialists, um, such as Dr. Megan Clayton, has done a lot of work at KR blue stem eradication. They've looked at different methods. And unfortunately, I think glyphos glyphosate as an active ingredient herbicide is probably one of the most effective methods. Um, but we still don't have a perfect solution, unfortunately. It is an extremely invasive species. And unfortunately, if if any KR blue stem is around you, around your property that's not being controlled and you're only controlling or only able to control within your property, if there are still, is still some KR blue stem along the roadside or on neighboring property, you're gonna continue to fight it because seed is gonna continue to move into your property. Um, so just, just keep that in mind, unfortunately. All right, so native species, um, there's often interest in utilizing um, forage species that are native to the state of Texas. And so these are some native warm season perennials. Um, and I'll talk, we'll talk about the grasses. Different people have different reasons for being interested in natives. Um, they can obviously be utilized for grazing of livestock. A lot of people have interest in them just because of wanting our, our landscape to look more original, what it originally looked like before we came in and started cropping and planting Bermuda grass. Um, so there's interest in the, the more native, true landscape appearance um, or aesthetics, as well as supporting wildlife. Um, things such as quail, obviously Bermuda grass um, is not, does not support quail populations. It has a, a tight, dense side. It does not support their movements. Um, so it really impacts those quail populations. So that's why in East Texas, we have next to no quail. Um, as opposed to other parts of the state that have more rangeland, more open canopies, more open access for those, those animals, those birds to move. So if you're looking to establish native species, and we'll talk about some different species that are native to the state of Texas, establishment is, is a big challenge for any of our forage species. So it's very important to select species that are adapted to your location, um, create a well-prepared seed bed, follow planting recommendations as far as seeding rates, timing, how deep that seed needs to be planted, and then seed quality. That will be very important. It is very important to know that with our native grasses, they can take three to five years to have, true, to have an established stand. Um, so you may not want to convert all of your property at one time. You may want to do smaller acreage, smaller parts of your property at a time so that you do have grazing available if you're going to try to maintain livestock at the same time. So these are just some of the recommended plants. There are more native um, broadleaf plants that are adapted to the state. Our native grasses include little blue stem, big blue stem, Indian grass, eastern gamma grass, switchgrass, side oats grama, um, and then forbs. I do recommend if you are planting, um, if you want to establish natives, I would recommend planting a mixture, whether it's two different grasses like little blue stem and Indian grass, or, or maybe even including some forbs or some broadleaf plants such as Maximilian sunflower, Illinois bundle flower, what have you. Um, Illinois bundle flower is actually a legume, so that would be a way to recycle some nitrogen in a grazing system. Um, so there are I would recommend a combination if you really wanted a true kind of a native landscape appearance or aesthetic. Now, of course, obviously having multiple species will support different, um, different wildlife as well as supporting your livestock. So this is Illinois bundle flower, just to, to show you some, some pictures. 
but it's well, obviously well adapted um, in the central part of our state. Maximilian sunflower, um, very attractive for, for birds because of their seed production. Some of our grasses, um, big blue stem, are, keep in mind all of our grasses are going to be perennial. So once they're established, if we support that forage growth and production, they will persist for multiple years. Um, big blue stem is one of the big four grasses of the American tall grass prairie. Those top four would be big blue stem, little blue stem, switchgrass, and Indian grass, if I remember that correctly. Um, it does contribute to wildlife habitat as far as providing cover, um, nesting, and denning. <clears throat> big blue stem is well adapted to sandy or loamy sand or loamy soils. Um, so in central Texas and even parts of East Texas, um, which don't have a lot of, there's not necessarily a lot of interest in East Texas for native forages, um, but there might be um, a few people who have interest. A big blue stem, there's a picture of big blue stem. <clears throat> big blue stem is, is well adapted to very similar environments that little blue stem is. Um, some sandy, sandy loam soils, well adapted to those locations and would also provide denning or nesting especially for small mammals and, and birds. Eastern gamma grass, um, it is highly palatable. It is recommended to rotationally graze eastern gamma grass. It, because it's so palatable or desirable by livestock, they would very easily overgraze eastern gamma grass. Um, so it would require some sort of limited grazing uh, <clears throat> management to reduce or to prevent overgrazing. <clears throat> Excuse me. Eastern gamma grass is better adapted to poorly drained soils as opposed to well drained soils that little blue stem and big blue stem are better adapted to. <clears throat> Indian grass um, has a bright gold flower plume typically in the fall as you can see in the picture on the right. Um, it is also highly palatable for grazing livestock and it does prefer well drained soils. And here's a picture. This is um, just, I think it's just south of Dallas Fort Worth. This is a field that's a combination of Indian and little blue stem. Um, so this gives you an idea of potentially what having multiple species might look like. And this is actually a pasture, um, <clears throat> a picture taken by a producer that, that I know. So it is actually utilized for grazing of, of livestock. Switchgrass. Um, it has been, a lot of research has been done, especially in Tennessee. Um, evaluating switchgrass is a biomass energy stock. Um, it does produce a lot of vegetation. It's very tall. It produces a lot of forage. We can actually grow switchgrass in Overton. Um, Dr. Monty Rukat has done some work with the Noble Research Institute evaluating switchgrass, different varieties, looking at yield um, for, the, for the potential for biomass energy. Um, it is one of the main prairie type grasses, so it is well adapted to well drained soils. We'll tell you here in Overton, we tend to have very sandy or sandy loam soils um, that are well drained. We do have some bottoms, but where our switchgrass is growing is, is very, it's basically on a heel top, so it is extremely well drained. <clears throat> Sadoats grama is another one of our native species. Um, it's highly palatable compared to some of our other range species. Um, and you can see in um, all of our native grasses are going to be bunch type grasses. So they grow in bunches. So they have a very open sod. Um, so that is why it's recommended that we plant um, multiple species and include some forbs so that we can increase that ground cover. Um, even though we do want some open ground, especially for small mammals movement of quail or other small birds. Um, that is still important, but by maintaining maintaining those those forages, a combination of the natives and some forbs can help reduce soil erosion, <clears throat> even though we have a more open side. Something else we need to keep in mind with our native grasses, um, when we talked about Bermuda grass and Bahia grass, and many of our introduced warm season perennials will tolerate close continuous grazing. Um, unfortunately, our native grasses will not tolerate close continuous grazing, so they tend to require much more intensive grazing management in regards to likely a lower stocking rate, so fewer animals per acre um, and less grazing pressure. 
Um, we have to maintain a stubble height of at least 10 to 12 inches on our native grasses in order for them to regrow, for them to persist for multiple seasons. If we came in there and grazed that, those native grasses down to a three or four inch stubble height, we've basically overgrazed them and they're not gonna grow back. Whereas Bermuda grass, Bahia grass, we can graze almost down to the soil level and they will grow back as long as they have moisture and, and fertility. A little blue stem <clears throat> um, unfortunately doesn't provide a lot of forage for livestock such as deer and, and that's one thing people are often confused about is our native grasses are not necessarily very attractive for white-tailed deer. Um, deer in general are more um, prefer more forbs or higher very high quality forages. Um, things such as legumes and forbs are much more attractive to them than actual grasses. Um, blue stems, little blue stem does provide seed uh, and forage for birds and small mammals. Um, it does have value for livestock as far as grazing. You can harvest our native grasses for hay, however it's very challenging since it does require higher stubble height. So you'd have to set your mower bar significantly higher than what most of us are used to. So I would actually only recommend the utilization of native species for grazing. If you were wanting to produce hay, then you need to look at some of our introduced um, worm season perennials for a, hay, for a hay option as opposed to our native species. So I did want to, to talk um, very quickly about some worm season annual forages. Like I said, the basis, the kind of the foundation of many of our forage systems are, is based around perennials. Those that once they are established will per persist for multiple seasons. But there are a lot of annual forages, forages that would have to be planted every year that may fit or fill in gaps where there's nutritional gaps um, in regards to forage production. And there are some warm season annual grasses that we can establish in various parts of our state um, that can potentially fill in gaps or provide additional grazing or additional hay when we might need it. Um, now, it will be very important to understand that our worm season, any annual species, obviously we're going to have to plant every year. <clears throat> so that is a, a cost that we're incurring every, every year. Um, so you also have to look at the value versus the cost. <clears throat> our warm season annual grasses are typically planted in April or May and can provide forage within about 60 days. Um, now their forage production is going to be very dependent on rainfall and very dependent on fertilization as well. Um, they can provide two to three tons per acre, potentially provide multiple grazing events or multiple harvest, potentially if you're looking at harvesting. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, they are, they do very well in hot, dry weather, but their yield is still going to be dependent on rainfall. Does require annual land preparation, planting, and fertilization. Um, if you are, so that, that means a prepared seed bed. So tilling the soil, having a clean prepared seed bed for establishment of these species. <clears throat> Some producers may have a part of their property that is for annual forages. So in the, they plant a warm season annual. Once that season is over in the fall, they plant a cool season annual. So that property is always in use. Um, it's never fallow and increasing the risk of soil erosion. It's just being turned over from one annual species to another from season to season. If you are looking, as we'll look at some of these warm season annual grasses, you will notice that they have a thicker stem and a thicker leaf than many of our warm season perennial grasses. So as far as harvesting these species for hay, it will require a mower conditioner um, to break up those thick stems and thick leaves to expedite curing for a dry hay product. So they will take longer to cure compared to Bermuda grass or Bahia grass if you wanted to use these species for hay production. <clears throat> Pearl millet is our first warm season annual. It is better adapted in East Texas or in very sandy soils that tend to have a low soil pH. Um, so for many of my producers in East Texas, pearl millet is probably a better fit um, compared to our forage sorghums or sorghum sedan grass. Um, it does have a finer stem compared to sorghum sedan grass. That picture I showed you earlier, this is actually some, um, some 
uh, some steers actually grazing pearl millet. This is in South Georgia. Um, but it, if you graze it at a, if you maintain a stubble height, you will potentially have regrowth of pearl millet. Um, whenever we do have hot, dry conditions and not a lot of moisture, pearl millet will actually produce an alkaloid that decreases palatability. Um, so in years when we have dry, hot summers, even if a producer has pearl millet, their cattle oftentimes will stop grazing. They'll eat everything else they can reach through the fence or anything else that's growing in that pasture as opposed to the pearl millet. Um, then once they have rainfall and growth, they'll continue to graze the pearl millet. It's just primarily a palatability issue. Our, there are forage sorghums. Of course, there are grain sorghums and there are forage sorghums. Um, that we can utilize for grazing or for hay production. Our sorghum species are better adapted to our clay or loam soils in Central Texas. Uh, so forage sorghum and sorghum sudan grass. Um, sorghum sudan grass hybrids have the highest yield potential of any of our warm season annuals. Um, they are unfortunately more severely affected by drought. They do have they do grow. They have better production in some of our heavier soils, those clay soils that do tend to hold on to more moisture than our sandy soils in East Texas. So, <clears throat> so for our East Texas, very sandy locations, um, we do tend, pearl millet does tend to do much better in, in this part of the state as opposed to Central Texas. Um, sorghum sudan grass is not recommended for horses. Um, there is an unidentified toxin that can cause paralysis for equine. So it's very important to understand if you are if you have horses on your property as well. <clears throat> Here's a picture of a sorghum sedan grass hybrid. Um, as you can see, it has a thick stem, much thicker than Bermuda grass or Bahia grass or another warm season perennial. So it would require a mower conditioner if you were looking to produce a dry hay. Our forage sorghums um, have a little bit more substantial grain head compared to the uh, sorghum sedan grasses, but less grain production compared to our grain sorghums of course, um, there are different varieties of our forage sorghums. Um, there's brown midrib hybrids. Um, those are hybrids that brown midrib increases the digestibility. So it increases the leaf to stem ratio. So it increases the nutritive value of those of that forage sorghum. Sudan grass, I'll have a picture here in a second, are much finer stems and more leafier and more leaf compared to our forage sorghums. It'll be very obvious here shortly. Um, it has excellent regrowth following a harvest or grazing. It is not as productive as pearl millet or our sorghum sedan grass hybrids. Um, there is a, a brown midrib variety of sedan grass that increases that digestibility. So you can see sedan grass is much finer stemmed compared to our forage sorghums for sure. Um, crabgrass is another warm season annual. Most producers in Texas oftentimes view crabgrass as a weed. Um, our, it's important to understand that our warm season annuals are going to be higher in nutritive value than our warm season perennials. Our annuals will always have higher nutritive value than perennials. And our cool season forages will always have higher nutritive value compared to warm season forages. It's based on how these plants have to grow, the environment within which they grow, and an annual has a shorter lifespan. Um, they're not having to persist for multiple years, multiple seasons. So they they're tend to be higher in nutritive value. So crabgrass has excellent forage value. It's gonna be higher in nutritive value than even Tifton 85 Bermuda grass. It is not drought tolerant. Um, it does not necessarily tolerate flooded um, or standing water, but it does require good soil moisture. We do tend to see more crabgrass when we have quite a bit more consistent rainfall patterns in, in parts of Central and East Texas. It has good reseeding potential. Um, it is established from seed. Many of the varieties that are recommended actually come out of Oklahoma, um, and it can be utilized for grazing or for harvesting. Now it is thicker stem and leaf compared to Bermuda grass. So it'll take longer to cure crabgrass hay compared to Bermuda grass. Um, so that is important to note. Here's a picture of crabgrass. Another warm season annual that I'm actually just had a question about today and I get asked about frequently is teff. 
Um, it is a warm season annual. It is finer leaved and stemmed than most warm season annual grasses. This is a picture of Tuff. Um, it is very fine leafed and very fine stemmed. I've grown it um, myself or I've grown it as part of a project in Overton. It is very popular horse hay in New Mexico and California. And there's a lot of interest in it as a horse hay in, in Texas, um, as well as just an, a different forage. Um, it is an annual, so it does have to be established every year. It's an extremely small seed. It can be easily established by broadcasting. It is well adapted to a variety of soil types. Um, it is not drought tolerant. It would require irrigation if you are in a more, in a more arid environment. Um, <clears throat> it, is, it can be very productive. It is subject to lodging. Um, it, it grows, it produces substantial height. So if it's not harvested at the right time, it will actually lodge. So it basically lays down flat um, and it's very, it's impossible to harvest at that point once it's laid down. Weed control is the biggest challenge during establishment year. And if you're harvesting tough, you have to maintain at least a three to four inch stubble height for regrowth. Um, and that the time between harvest and during establishment are the biggest, the biggest concern during those times is weed control or weed issues um, because it's not very competitive. So you will have weed pressure that you would need to manage between harvesting events and during the establishment year. Um, so, but it, that can also potentially be an option for a warm season annual and it will grow in central and east Texas. Um, we did try to grow some up in Amarillo our biggest challenge was drought and, and irrigation, especially during that establishment. Um, <clears throat> so it's very tricky, especially in, in that part of the state, um, or can potentially be tricky. Um, so our warm season annuals will have different seeding rates, planting times typically April to June. Um, most of these can be established by broadcasting seed or by drilling seed, depending on your equipment that you have available. Um, but if you have more interest in a specific recommendation, I'll be, I'll be happy to answer any of those questions. Um, I know we're getting close on, on time. There are a lot of forage species that we can utilize in the state of Texas. Um, it really comes down to location, what is adapted to your location. Like I said, the basis, basis of our forage systems is typically our warm season perennial forages or grasses. Um, that are adapted to our location wherever you are in the state. There are a lot of annual species that we can incorporate. The incorporation of cool season annuals is probably much more common in central and east Texas, whether it's small grain or annual ryegrass um, to provide grazing during the winter and spring, at basically at this time of year for, for us in east Texas. Um, <clears throat> right now we have a lot of annual ryegrass that is growing. I will tell you annual ryegrass um, it requires a lot of rainfall so our annual ryegrass production is primarily east of I-35. Um, so if you are west of I-35 it's not typically recommended even with with irrigation it's just not as a, um, adapted in those more arid environments. Um, but it is a an option for grazing in in central and east Texas um, kind of during that spring time period. Even though we call it a winter forage, the majority of its production will be from February on into April. Um, so it's almost more of a spring forage um, and as you look at the calendar as opposed to a winter forage. But many our, all of our cool season annual forages would be established in the fall. So kind of late September, early October, or primarily six weeks prior to your average frost date. Uh, so for us, that's late September, early October. <clears throat> further north, that may be an earlier planting time. Further south, down into Corpus um, location or Houston area, um, typically can get away with planting much later compared to those of us in um, kind of in East Texas or Northeast Texas. Um, several small grains that we can utilize for cool season forages, <clears throat> small grain rye. Um, it's well adapted to a variety of soil types in Central or East Texas. Um, planting late September, early October, majority of its forage production will be um, <clears throat> from December on into April. Um, we may be able to graze um, mildly in the fall, especially on ryegrass or even on some of our small grains. 
but still a majority of our grazing would be almost more of a spring time as opposed to a true winter. Oats are not cold tolerant, so most of our oat production is going to be kind of in central Texas and, and south Texas, or sorry, southeast Texas. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> they do prefer kind of warmer temperatures. They are not cold tolerant, so even where I'm located in East Texas, which I'm close to I-20 as far as um, northern location, um, wheat and rye are much more commonly utilized as opposed to oats just because of the, the lack of cold hardiness in oats. Wheat um, are very, is very cold tolerant, so north of I-20, it's utilized as a dual purpose crop for many producers. They use it for grazing as well as for harvesting the, the grain it's very important in regards to timing to, to be able to utilize it both for grazing as well as for, for a grain crop. Triticale is another cool season annual grass. Um, it's a cross between wheat and rye. Um, it is adapted to very similar locations as um, oats or wheat. They're adapted to a more heavier soil. Uh, small grain rye is adapted to a variety of soil types. It will grow in our sandy soils in East Texas as well as some of our heavier soils in the more central part of the state. <clears throat> um, another forage species that I get a lot of questions about is legumes. Um, so there are a lot of different legumes that we can utilize in the state of Texas. Our cool season annual legumes, majority of that production on things like arrowleaf clover, crimson clover, um, that are primarily going to be east of I-35. Those cool season annual legumes are better adapted to a higher moisture environment, higher rainfall area. There are some, some native legumes, Illinois bundle flower. Um, there are other native legume species that can be utilized. Um, there are warm season legumes that can be utilized in various locations, warm season annuals such as cowpea or lab lab. Um, their biggest challenge oftentimes, especially lab lab, is seed availability. Um, our warm season annual legumes, it is recommended that they are planted or established into a prepared seed bed. Um, they do not do well interseeded into a warm season perennial side where you already have Bermuda grass or Bahia grass established. <clears throat> they often will require some grazing management because they can, especially lab lab, it can be easily overgrazed by livestock. Um, our warm season annual legumes are more commonly used for attracting white-tailed deer in mixtures with other forage species. So for food plots, um, a lot of times you'll find cow peas and some of those wildlife mix, especially for deer. <clears throat> um, another legume that I get a lot of questions about in Texas is alfalfa. Um, alfalfa is a perennial legume. <clears throat> It is extremely site specific. Um, there are parts of Texas, there are locations in Texas where we can <clears throat> successfully grow alfalfa. One of the biggest issues in East Texas or in parts of our state is cotton root rot. Um, so if cotton has been grown on your property in previous years, <clears throat> cotton root rot could potentially be damaging to a stand of alfalfa. Um, if you have questions about the soil types or how to determine if your lo your property is, is appropriate for alfalfa production, please feel free to, to reach out to me. I'll be happy to answer any questions or point you towards some resources that can help with that information. Um, but it is extremely site specific. Um, it can be utilized for grazing. It can be utilized for hay harvest as well. Um, but as with any of our forage species, there are challenges um, there's not one silver bullet as far as our forage production systems that works for everyone and, and fits everybody's need and that has requires no inputs or has no challenges. So do keep that in mind. Um, so just in, in general, just remember to match your forage species to your location, to your soil type, to your average annual rainfall and match it to your production system and to your goals. Um, so what you're trying to achieve. I'm going to, <clears throat> due to time, I'm going to uh, skip ahead. I'm happy to to share my slides if anyone is interested in, especially for, for visual aspects or any information that you weren't able to catch. Um, you can send me an email and I'll be happy to, to share those with you. 
If you have any specific questions about a forage species, I'll be happy to, to answer that. And I see there are likely some questions that I can, I can jump on. I did want to mention I have a website. It's foragefacts.tamu.edu. It's an excellent resource for forage information. I will say that it is probably, um, most of it is, is more centered on Central and East Texas. Um, you may still find some information that's of value to you if you live in another part of the state. Um, just a lot of general best management practices and recommendations on soil testing or um, different sources of nutrients, uh, weed control, just some, some general best management practices as well as some more specific information. Um, you can subscribe to this website. Um, anytime I post a new article, you'll receive an email. Um, and those typically go out on Friday at 5. Um, I never see your personal email address, so I cannot sell your information to anyone. Um, so you'll only get information from this, this specific website. You should not get any additional junk mail or undesired information. Um, there's a, some publications, events that are either hosted in College Station or if you're local to East Texas in Overton or virtually these days that you might be of interest or might be interested in. So I will jump over if it's appropriate to the question and A or the Q&A and I'll be happy to address any of those. Um, <clears throat> so the first question is what prohibits Bermuda grass from growing in the Edwards Plateau? Um, so the biggest challenge is soil type and then lack of rainfall. So average annual rainfall in your soil type. Um, you may be able to get it established, but likely it will not persist. Uh, so we tend not to recommend forage varieties or species, even if you could get them established, that aren't going to persist, especially if they're meant to be a perennial or to persist for multiple seasons. Um, <clears throat> so unfortunately, for the Edwards Plateau, Bermuda grass is not a recommended forage species. Um, Another question, does Klein grass retain its toxicity after being dried for hay? Yes, it does as far as for horses, sheep, or goats. Now it is not toxic for cattle um, and it can be harvested for hay for cattle, but do not feed it hay or pasture to goats, sheep, or horses. <clears throat> All right, next um, I have a lot of what I think is yellow blue stem. How do I know which blue stem it is? Um, that's an excellent question. You can try to look at some, some photos online. Um, I can direct you to some books that might be helpful if you're wanted to purchase a book, um, but try to do some comparison. If you're still not sure, I would reach out either to your county extension agent or to a local NRCS, the Natural Resource Conservation Service. They may be able to help um, confirm identification if you reach out to your county extension agent and they're unable to, to identify it personally, they will know some resources within Texas A&M AgriLife Extension that they can reach out to to help confirm identification. <clears throat> you can try to send them some pictures. Um, if, I will tell you, if you're trying to get help with identification of any plant, whether it's a grass that you want to know, confirm what blue stem it is, or a weed, a broadleaf plant or another grass that you think is a weed that you want to identify. Um, if you're going to send them pictures, the more pictures you take, the better. Um, you can take pictures in the field, pull that plant out, um, take a picture on the bed of your truck or on the concrete on some kind of light colored background. Um, make sure your pictures are in focus. If, if you can, if you're close to your, your county extension agent or an NRCS office, oftentimes I'm even here in Overton, I've had producers bring me plants in buckets or in pots um, to help them identify. Um, so throw them in with some soil, water them so they don't dry up or start to, to degrade and change their shape and form and that can help um, with some, some identification. So that I would recommend looking at some pictures and then if you're still not sure, reach out to either NRCS or Extension to help with that identification. <clears throat> I 
what about cool season perennial grasses to be planted and utilized by grazing west of I-35 in north central Texas? Um, so I'm not aware of any cool season perennials that are adapted to that location. Um, the one cool season perennial that I get questions about is tall fescue. <clears throat> it is not adapted west of I-35. Um, tall fescue is not drought tolerant. Um, it doesn't even, it, even in Northeast Texas, it requires very poorly drained locations, creek bottom locations for it to potentially persist. It prefers heavier soils that have a lot of moisture. Like I said, it's not drought tolerant. So I'm not aware of a cool season perennial that is adapted um, west of I-35, kind of in that North Central Texas, unfortunately. <clears throat> so how is Bermuda grass grown in South Texas, which has less rain than Edwards Plateau? Once again, it's that soil type. Um, your soil type has a huge impact <clears throat> on whether on your ability to grow Bermuda grass in the Edwards Plateau. What is the best source of native warm season perennial mixes suited to a particular area? If you are looking for seed, there are multiple seed uh, retailers in, in the state of Texas. You may have a local retailer. I know there is MBS seed in Denton, Texas. Um, there's also Pogue Agri Suppliers in Kennedy, Texas. Um, there's I already, I lost my train of thought. Um, there is um, Texas native seeds. I think they're down further in South Texas. <clears throat> I'm trying to remember if I can think of any other seed retailers off the top of my head. You can try locally if you have a local feed and seed um, and see if they have, if they have a resource, a wholesaler that they have access to that sells native seed. Um, I'm not sure how many mixes there are. A lot of the mixes are often promoted more for wildlife. If you're looking for livestock, um, I would recommend creating kind of your own mix. So buying multiple species, such as little blue stem and Indian grass. Um, you know, you would have to buy them as, as separate seeds and then plant them um, collectively together. Um, a lot of the mixes that are pre-made a lot of times are for, for wildlife or for um, you know, kind of more horticultural type um, scenario. But I would ask a local retailer, they may have a wholesaler that they have access to. Um, but MBS Seed in Denton, I know has um, a lot of forage grass seed. So does East Texas Seed in Tyler, Texas. Um, not aware that they carry any native species, um, but they carry a lot of our perennial or introduced, or introduced species, Bermuda grass, even our warm season, cool season annuals. Um, Pogue Agri Suppliers and Kennedy, like I mentioned earlier. Um, but you can also ask your county extension agent. They may have know someone more locally that has some has some seed um, that might be more, or like I said, locally easier to attain and potentially cheaper because of lack of transportation or need for that shipping. Another question: uh, What do you think about buffalo grass for Carnes County? I have 30 acres and it seems to be good in our climate. <clears throat> Buffalo grass is another forage species. Um, there's a lot of, I guess, people have mixed reviews. Um, it can be a valuable forage. I would have to look at a map to remind myself where Carnes County is. Um, unfortunately, I'm not originally from Texas, um, so I'm still learning where all the counties are 12 and a half years later. Um, so I may, uh, Mr. Alexander, um, if you want to reach out to me um, directly, I'll be happy to, to delve into that a little bit more for you. I unfortunately don't know where Carnes County is off the top of my head. Um, if you do want my contact information, you can find it on the Forage Facts website. Um, if you click that little home button in the left, or home tab in the left corner, you will see my contact information, email address, and phone number here at the Overton office. Um, and you can, you're always welcome to reach out. All right, next question. Once your coastal Bermuda grass grows tall and turns brown in the fall time frame, does it still provide nutritional value? That's an excellent question. So one thing that we can do with Bermuda grass and Bahia grass both, um, we can stockpile uh, forage. So there's a specific method in regards to doing that to optimize production as well as quality, nutritive value, 
once we have a frost, our nutritive value of our burrito grass to brahe grass does not drop off like a cliff. It doesn't just plummet down to absolutely nothing. It actually retains a lot of its nutritive value um, up until about January, February, when we do tend to get more moisture. Um, so then we'll see a greater decline in protein content or crude protein and digestibility or energy. Um, so you can stockpile your Bermuda grass or Bahia grass. There are specific recommendations. You have to remove cattle, keep them from grazing it for a certain number of days. Um, you may need to take a harvest or graze it down um, to allow basically accumulation of forage kind of during that September, October time period. So you want about 60 days of growth. Um, you would need to fertilize, obviously, to promote that growth and nutritive value. And then you would let it accumulate, you would let it grow, and then you would not graze it until following your first frost. So when we think about feeding hay, you would actually graze that forage, that standing forage, as opposed to feeding a bale of hay. Um, <clears throat> There are pros and cons to that. I can answer any additional questions you have about that, but our forage quality does not drop off um, or plummet down to zero just because our forages have gone dormant. It still retains some value. Next question: Can the tall grass native can excuse me can the tall grass native grasses thrive in clay loam as well as in sandy loam? Um, yes, they can. Um, it will often depend on, you know, we may have different variety, different species recommendations based on a clay loam versus a sandy loam, as well as whether it's a well-drained or a poorly drained location. Um, if it's a well-drained location, little blue stem, big blue stem, Indian grass, um, if it's a poorly drained location, eastern gamma grass would be an option. So that is why as you look at your property, you may need to use multiple species of those natives because you may have a well-drained location, but then you may have a poorly drained location. So I've been in native pastures where there's a strip, basically a strip of Eastern gamma grass where there's some, you know, some low line or kind of a dip in a pasture where there's some more moisture. And then the rest of the field may be little blue stem and big blue stem because it's well-drained. Um, so yes, you do, have, you do have options in clay loam as well as sandy loam. All right, what is your opinion on pasture aeration for native grasses in Central Texas? <clears throat> so, so aeration typically implies using an aerator, a hay king, um, an airway. There are different names for these implements and oftentimes they are spikes um, that may not necessarily be very deep that just kind of poke holes in our soil. Um, they do open the soil surface to allow for, um, to reduce runoff, to allow for absorption of moisture, rainfall. Um, why most people in central Texas are going to be using some kind of implement to kind of break up the soil is if they have soil compaction. And our heavier soils, especially our black land clays or heavy clay soils that are subject to compaction, then we may need to use we may need to do something about that compaction. Now, unfortunately, soil compaction is gonna be deeper. It's usually 12 inches or deeper in our soil and not necessarily in that top two to three inches. Um, a lot of those aerators may not go any deeper than five or six inches. Um, it really depends on how big or how long those spikes are. The point of aeration would be to increase water retention or water absorption um, as a, and reduce some soil erosion. Now you do have to be careful with aeration. If you are doing aeration, it needs to be done during the dormant season when we do tend to have more moisture. So that may be a January, February time period um, when those warm season perennials are dormant. Now, if you, if you think you have soil compaction, that would require a different implement, um, may require something such as a paratil plow it takes deeper soil disturbance to break up that sub layer of soil compaction. Um, so that would be a different, totally different ball game compared to aeration. Um, so the whole point of soil aeration would be to reduce runoff of moisture and to capture that, that moisture. Um, but you do need to keep in mind anytime we disturb the soil, even simple aeration, you are running the risk or you're going to potentially promote seed germination 
of some plants that you're not going to find desirable, whether it's a broadleaf weed or other grasses that you may not find desirable. So it is important to understand that. You may have to use methods, weed control methods to reduce those populations during that time. Um, <clears throat> but just be mindful of, of using aeration. Um, so the sole purpose is to, to improve water absorption. It will not improve the forage production. Um, it's just gonna improve water absorption. All right. I'm in South Houston. I've been taught to plant ryegrass in October timeframe to supplement grazing. This year I noted that there were several types. There are better kind of rye to plant. Okay, so you mentioned um, two things. Ryegrass, annual ryegrass is one species and cereal rye, small grain rye is another species. Both are cool season annuals. Annual ryegrass is going to be more productive, produce more forage, compared to small grain rye. Uh, small grain rye is gonna have a larger seed, um, needs to be planted at least an inch deep. Annual ryegrass is very small seeded. There are different varieties of both annual ryegrass as well as small grain rye. Annual ryegrass is gonna have more, much more variety choices compared to small grain rye. Uh, for ryegrass, you may be familiar with Marshall, uh, Prine, um, there's Nelson, Tam Tebow, Tam 90. Um, trying to remember some of the other varieties. There are a lot of varieties of annual ryegrass. Um, planting time typically late September, early October. For Houston, October, <clears throat> mid to late October is likely to be an appropriate time for establishment. Um, annual ryegrass, even our small grains, the majority of their production is going to be in that spring time period. There are some ryegrass varieties such as um, <clears throat> uh, Tam 90 and Nelson, and even Tam Tebow that will actually provide a little bit more fall grazing, some earlier grazing compared to some of our older varieties such as Marshall <coughs> and some of our other varieties. Um, so your varieties can influence maybe some of that production and timing. You could potentially graze November to December um, you would have to increase your stocking rate or potentially harvest excess forage in the spring because you have so much forage production in that spring time period. Uh, what are the best herbicides to use to kill vasey grass? Okay, so for vasey grass control, um, and our best, best option to actually kill it is going to be glyphosate, which is the active ingredient in Roundup, Glystar, a lot of other products, but glyphosate is the active ingredient. Pastora will suppress vasey grass, but it will not kill it. So it will just prevent it from producing a seed head. Um, so glyphosate is unfortunately our, our best option, our only option to kill vasey grass. Okay, I think there are some questions potentially in the chat um, that I can answer as well. All right, my hay fields are Alicia rather than coastal. Seems like they make a great bell, get three to four cuttings a year. Got three last year in bad conditions. Lately read some stuff online suggesting that this is an inferior grass to coastal. Do you agree? So, <clears throat> My opinion is, if you have a variety of Bermuda grass that is working well for you, that is already established, that fits your needs, um, that is producing the amount of forage you need or want, then why do you want to change? Um, <clears throat> coast, you know, if we, here, we can go back. It may take a minute to get all the way back. Um, let's see. I'll, hold on, I'll get back to that slide so you can actually see Coastal versus Alicia. <clears throat> so, um, okay, I'm going to share again real quick. Sorry about that. <clears throat> so, Alicia is not, based on Dr. Burton's research, is not as productive, maybe a little lower in digestibility compared to Coastal Bermuda grass. But still you're looking at over 90% digestibility um, or compared to coastal, you know, it's 90% it's relative to coastal. Production is, is really close to coastal Bermuda grass. 
So my opinion is if it is, if Alicia Bermuda grass is working for you, you don't have any problems. You are happy with the yield. You're happy with the quality of hay you are producing. Then I, I don't see a reason to change. Remember, <clears throat> Not everybody in the state of Texas needs to grow Tifton and A5 Bermuda grass or coastal Bermuda grass. You need to grow what works for you. Um, <clears throat> if I personally had Alicia Bermuda grass and it was working for my production system, it was working for my personal goals, then I wouldn't, I wouldn't think about changing. Now, if I wanted something more productive, um, then yes, then maybe I would look at using a different Bermuda grass variety. Um, if I started to have problems with my Alicia, if it wasn't persisting, um, and <clears throat> or I just got tired of, of supporting Alicia Bermuda grass, then maybe I would make a change. But it, it, just because someone tells you that coastal is better, and it is going to be higher yielding and higher nutritive value, but if the Alicia is working for you, then there's not necessarily, I wouldn't necessarily change just because I mean, you could plant Tipton 85, it's more, even more productive and, and higher nutritive value. Um, but it comes down to what, <clears throat> what your personal goals are um, and what you're trying to achieve. So don't discount it just because somebody else says that, just because some, there is something better doesn't mean that that's what you personally need to grow on your property. Um, so when are you supposed to do a light disking? <clears throat> so that's a loaded question. <clears throat> So <clears throat> if we're talking about Bermuda grass, I'm assuming that's potentially what we're talking about. The times that I recommend, the, the time that I recommend the light disking is if you're going to overseed with any cool season forages. So you want to overseed that dormant Bermuda grass with rye grass or a legume, a cool season annual legume, then I recommend a light disking. And that is to increase your seed to soil contact because if you have a very dense sod of Bermuda grass and you broadcast a seed, you're not going to have good seed to soil contact. So that is when I recommend a light disking if you are going to overseed a cool season forage into that Bermuda grass side or even that Bahia grass side. That is when I would recommend a light disking. A lot of people want to do a disking or some sort of disturb disturbance on their Bermuda grass or Bahia grass, such as aeration or disking when it's dormant um, in hopes to increase production. <clears throat> if you do a light disk, <clears throat> excuse me, a light disking on Bermuda grass in January, February when it's dormant, which was when would be when I would recommend it if you're going to do it for whatever reason and you're not planting ryegrass or, or small grain or a legume the only thing you're doing is you are breaking up those rhizomes and stolons that are moving above the ground above the soil surface and below the soil surface so it will promote tillering so you'll have more offshoots from those rhizomes and stolons it will not increase your yield of bermuda grass the only things that are going to improve your yield are rainfall and nutrients um, so nitrogen phosphorus and potassium of light disking will not improve your yield. Um, light disking, disturbing that sod in the fall for winter forages, for planting of winter forages, or in January, February, thinking you're going to improve production will actually decrease your Bermuda grass production the following season. <clears throat> um, Dr. Evers, Gerald Evers, who's a retired forage physiologist from Overton Center, um, did some research on just did a light disking in the fall on a Bermuda grass side, did not plant anything, and he reduced the Bermuda grass yield the following season. Um, so <clears throat> it, you do have to keep that in mind. It's not going to increase your yield. If And that is why some people do it. They think that by disking, they're promoting tillering, and that results in higher yields, and that is not the case. It does promote tillering, but it does not increase your yield. Um, <clears throat> Okay, um, I make hay out of prairie grass and the maker cuts the grass very short. We have been harvesting hay from this meadow for many years. I do a control burn in January or February. It keeps growing. We have been cutting for over 50 years. Are you saying that I need to stop making hay from the prairie grass? <clears throat> so uh, before I answer that question, I would want to know exactly what is your prairie grass? 
Um, a holly doubt, it's a native species. A holly doubt, it's little blue stem or big blue stem if they're harvesting it that short, if they're harvesting it very short, um, <clears throat> especially for that length of time. Um, so I would be interested in exactly what it is. It's likely an introduced species, uh, maybe an old world blue stem um, that was planted years ago. And um, a lot of, you know, it's very confusing because a lot of those old world blue stems will look like native blue stems, but they are very different. Um, so it would come down to exactly what that species is um, in regards to what I might recommend moving forward uh, as far as hay, hay harvesting. Um, let's see. All right. <clears throat> uh, so there's a question with my comments and recommendations vary if applied to wildlife um, versus livestock or cattle. Um, yes, it's going to depend on the wildlife species that you're trying to you're trying to attract on your property. Um, as far as what some of the forage recommendations might be, especially as far as species. Um, remember our wildlife, you know, we need forages for wildlife for different reasons. For deer, um, we're typically planting high protein forages. Um, for our, for white-tailed deer, they tend to, protein tends to be low in the summer. So we tend to often need to kind of um, provide more protein, especially during that time period, potentially for deer. Um, so I know my, my husband is a hunter. He hunts white-tailed deer in East Texas. And I've, I've convinced him to actually plant some, um, basically a, a mix that was developed by our legume breeder here, along with our, our previous wildlife specialist, Dr. Billy Higginbotham. Um, and it's a combination of some oats, some cowpeas, and some air leaf clover. It does very well in East Texas uh, for some food plots. They're planted in the fall. Um, and it, it helps to attract deer to our, to our prop, to his property, to our family's property for, for white-tailed deer. So there are going to be different forage species recommendations for wildlife. Um, but it, once again, it depends on the species. If you have specific wildlife questions, I'll be happy to, to help you find those answers. If I don't know them myself, we might have to work with a wildlife biologist to get some of the, the best recommendations or combination of recommendations. Um, is uh, little blue stem Indian grass and Forbes USDA has been out and named the grasses. Oh, okay. As far as your prairie grasses. Okay. Um, so that is surprising if they're cutting it that short that you've had persistence. Um, so you may want to think about if, if possible, asking the person that harvest your forages to leave a little bit higher stubble height. I don't know how short short is. I'm assuming you're talking three to four inches short. Um, I would recommend a little bit higher harvesting height if possible, if their equipment will allow it. It may not allow them to go all the way up to 10 inches, but leaving a little bit higher stubble height has never hurt any forage it helps with persistence. It helps with regrowth, even on Bermuda grass. Um, even though we can scalp it down to the soil level on Bermuda grass, that doesn't mean that we should all the time. Um, so if they can increase that cutting height, I think that will be beneficial. Um, even if you've been able to maintain that stand for 50 years at a short stubble height, it um, leaving a higher stubble height never hurts, always helps. I think I've gotten all of the questions, maybe. Um, if I have, oh, looks like there are some more questions. Sorry, that popped up on Q&A. Okay. I can keep answering questions. Um, I will just say as well, if someone needs to leave, I'm sure you can. You can always reach out to me. Like I said, my contact information is on Forage Facts. Um, it's probably the easiest way. Or you can Google Texas A&M at Overton. Uh, my contact information is on our Overton website as well. Email, give me a call. I'm happy to answer any questions about forages. Yes, and I will say this <clears throat> this record this presentation is being recorded. It will be posted to YouTube and it will be emailed out.
to everyone who registered tomorrow. So if you have time to answer the questions, um, mm -hmm. Dr. Olson, then please go ahead um, and okay. continue to have questions for anyone who's still watching. You can email them to, um, to TSCRA, education at tscra.org, and we will make sure all your questions are answered. But um, if you have time, Dr. Olson, then fire away. Okay, well, I'll keep, I'll keep answering. <clears throat> All right, <clears throat> so the, one of the most recent questions, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, I should drink some more. <clears throat> the question is, is it worth seeding ryegrass over Tifton 85 or would this prohibit early growth of Tifton Bermuda grass? <clears throat> so <clears throat> that depends. Um, and that's a popular extension answer, and, and that is usually very true. So <clears throat> the advantage of overseeding ryegrass is, one, you're making use of that space um, <clears throat> as opposed to, I mean, you can just let it stand there, but a lot of us are limited on number of acres we might have or pasture we have available for grazing. Annual ryegrass is a high quality forage. It's higher in nutritive value than Bermuda grass. It provides high quality forage when oftentimes we are feeding hay. Excuse me. Um, it can provide some fall grazing as well as some spring grazing. Because ryegrass is primarily a spring forage producer, it can impede Bermuda grass production in the, the spring and the summer. Um, so it can impact that production. <clears throat> One, because ryegrass is primarily a spring forage producer, if we do not manage that ryegrass by grazing or harvesting or the use of a herbicide to decrease production, it can outcompete Bermuda grass and it can prevent Bermuda grass or delay Bermuda grass from breaking dormancy and then actively growing. Depending on where you are in the state, for most of us, we get a lot of moisture or tend to get more moisture in the spring than we do in the middle of the summer in Texas. So if you have ryegrass that's actively growing in the spring, it's gonna use that moisture as opposed to your Bermuda grass. Um, so it's gonna compete for water as well as sunlight during that spring transition period. And it even, <clears throat> even if it's managed, you're gonna impact your yield that following season. So that is one reason I never recommend overseeding a hay meadow, um, unless it's a piece of property, maybe it's used for hay and pasture. So you're gonna graze it and then maybe harvest hay later. But if it's just a hay meadow, I do not recommend overseeding with any cool season forages in our hay meadows. So you have to look at your need um, as far as forage needs. Um, is the majority of your need during the summer for that Tifton 85 or do you need higher quality forage during this fall and spring and winter for your livestock um, and then that can help determine whether it's a value to you because it will impact your Bermuda grass production um, so you it's not not everybody overseeds with rye grass not everybody needs to not everybody wants to um, but it's a valuable forage. Um, a lot of producers in Central and East Texas do use cool season annuals for, to have grazing as opposed to feeding hay. Um, so it really depends on your specific situation and where your greatest need is, what time of year your greatest need is. <clears throat> All right, um, we have a 50 year old stand of Alicia Bermuda grass on silt loam soil with good drainage. Extended drought, uh, I'm gonna move this so I'm not looking at my other monitor. Extended drought reduced fertilization, feral hogs and neighbors, aerial broadcast of Bahia grass have all resulted in major reduction in Alicia. Soil tests were submitted and results expected soon. Do you expect Alicia can recover without chemical suppression of Bahia grass and others? <clears throat> if you have other species that are growing Bahia grass included in your Alicia Bermuda grass, it's going to require some herbicide, um, some weed management to eradicate those. Even with, even if you need to fertilize, even as you fertilize your Bermuda grass, that Bahia grass will use your fertilizer as well. Um, you're not going, that Alicia is not going to outcompete that Bahia grass. Um, so you will, it will require a herbicide. Metsulfuron methyl is the active ingredient that has activity on Bahia grass that is safe to use in Bermuda grass. That could be um, <clears throat> MSM60. 
which is met sulfuron methyl. It could be one of the Cimarron products, Cimarron Extra, Cimarron Plus, Cimarron Max. Um, there are multitude, uh, Pastora has met sulfuron methyl in it. So does Chaparral, another product with met sulfuron methyl. So it will require herbicides to control those, that bahia grass. Um, anytime you have active plant growth within a forage system, um, they're gonna use those nutrients you're going to have to, if you want to eradicate a specific plant, you're going to have to use a herbicide or some kind of weed management to, to eliminate that species. Um, Bermuda grass is not going to outcompete the hay of grass. Um, do I have a study on yield and digestibility for seeded Bermuda, um, for example, common Bermuda grass? I'm sure there is some, I can find some data, some research either at Overton or at another university in the Southeast that has looked at the nutritive value of common Bermuda grass. Um, there is some research on yield of many of our um, seeded varieties of Bermuda grass. There may be some nutritive value on some of the different seeded varieties. Um, I'm sure there's done some comparisons with common Bermuda grass. Um, now, how many other seeded varieties have been evaluated? I'm not I'm not sure exactly, uh, but I'd be happy to look for, for any additional information I can find and share that with you. Um, so Alan, if, if you wanna send me an email or send that an email to the TSCRA um, education email, um, I'm sure they can send that or forward that to me and I'll, I'll be happy to see what I can find and share with you. <clears throat> okay, another question. Um, is Tipton 85 adapted to north central Texas area in the rolling plains near Wichita Falls, Vernon area? <clears throat> I'd, I don't know if anyone has had success with Tipton 85 in that area. If, if they have, it's under irrigation. Um, I would need to check out, a, there's a, an, a forage agronomist at the Vernon station. There's a Texas A&M AgriLife Research and Extension Center in Vernon, Texas. Um, Dr. Emmy Kimura, I, I'd be happy to visit with her. Um, there probably is some Bermuda grass in that area, but it's probably all under irrigation. Um, I'm not sure that there would be much Tipton 85. Um, the other issue with Tipton 85 is cold tolerance. Um, it's not very cold hardy. Um, so as we get up into parts of Oklahoma, southern Oklahoma even, and further north, there's very little Tipton 85. Um, there are some other Bermuda grass varieties that might be better adapted to that area, such as Midland 99. Um, there are some varieties out of Oklahoma that are probably better adapted to that location, that Wichita Falls, Vernon area, as opposed to Tipton 85. All right, any other questions? Let's see if some came up in chat. Um, I think there are just some, well, maybe that's, that's a question, some, or just maybe some comments. Um, and I can put my, if I put my email address in the chat, will they be able to see it? Okay, mm -hmm. I'll drop my email address in here. Um, so that way you guys have it um, and you can reach out to me with any questions or if um, if I didn't answer your question completely or you need more information, more details, feel free to email me. Um, I think there were some questions someone might want to, if you're looking for the data on some of the seeded varieties, send me an email and I'll get that, I'll get that for you or find some for you. Well, Dr. Olson, we thank you so much for your time today. You have gone above and beyond to make sure that all of these questions have been answered and you've taken time out of your day. And we sincerely appreciate that. Um, as mentioned, if you're still watching and you do still have questions, um, you can email them um, to Dr. Olson herself or to education at tsra.org and we'll make sure to pass them along to her. Thank you so much for joining us today on Ranching 101. Absolutely. Um, we'll see you um, for everyone watching, hopefully next time when we talk about basic ranch record keeping. Thank you for your time, Dr. Olson. Uh, Y'all have a great Absolutely. Day. Thank you. You too.